After an entire decade of consistent training, my return to the basic fundamentals over the past year has given me insights that the previous nine years of training didn't even come close to. The bat contributes a massive amount to a strong and aesthetic looking physique. It is therefore no coincidence that it is also the largest muscle group in the upper body. To get a basic understanding of the anatomy, we can divide the back up into sections. You have the upper back, which spans across the scapula, the lower back, which wraps around the rib cage, the upper traps, which are located between the upper back and attach at the top of your neck, the lower traps, which sit in between the lower back muscles and the rear delts, which of course are located on the back of the shoulders. Armed with this knowledge, my initial approach to training was to choose exercises that isolated each individual area of the back. Rows to target the lower back and traps, pull downs to target the upper back, rear delt flies to of course target the rear delts, and shrugs to target the upper traps. The pros to this approach was that there is a high amount of variety, meaning I reduced my risk of causing a repetitive strain injury, and the novelty meant that I didn't get bored during my workouts. The main issue was that this really didn't give me the results I wanted for a number of reasons. Each exercise was heavily impacted by the fatigue caused from the previous exercise, meaning that I was likely training well beyond conventional failure, and recovery time was quickly becoming a hindrance. A full week of muscle soreness was not uncommon when using this approach to training. This quickly led to my other activities being affected. The amount of volume in a single training session was also very mentally taxing, meaning that my desire to train was diminished because I really didn't want my martial arts and tennis trainings to be impacted to that extent. The other major limiting factor was time efficiency. It goes without saying that a wide variety in exercise selection equates to a large training volume, which in turn equates to a greater time spent training. Returning to the fundamentals and placing a larger focus on form, consistency and progressive overload reduced my perceived time commitment and gave me better results than I'd seen in previous years of training. The neutral grip medium width pull up has been a game changer in getting me the lap development I've been chasing for years. Neutral grip entails that the palms face each other, whereas standard grips have the palms facing forward and chin ups involve reversing your grip with your palms facing in the opposite direction. The reason I suggest neutral grip is that it is the most natural position for your arms to be in. Palms facing forward or backward, as they would in a standard pull-up or chin-up, creates torsion within the shoulders, elbows, and wrist joints, as your muscles try to return your arms to a more natural position. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with training in different grip positions, so I encourage you to experiment and find what works best for you. Personally though, I found that neutral grip was most comfortable for me, making it more sustainable in the long term. Medium grip refers to the width that you are gripping the bar. The medium grip involves the arms being shoulder width apart, which again is a very natural position for the arms to be in. Wide grip involves gripping the bar further out than shoulder width, and close grip of course involves gripping the bar closer than shoulder width. In researching for this video, it was no surprise that the science also backed up my own findings. Studies showed that wider grip pull-ups reduce lat engagement and involve more of the rear delts. A narrow grip involves more upper lats and traps, which leaves medium grip as the perfect sweet spot, as it holistically targets all regions of the back effectively. In my personal experience, this has improved both the appearance of my back through increasing size and symmetry, as well as athletic performance, as reducing variables and focusing on just improving this one area made progress easy and measurable to track. Thus, training became more enjoyable and consistent. Following the high consistency training approach popularized by Kay Bogues, I would perform three sets of pull-ups within close proximity to muscle failure six days per week, leaving one entire day to just rest and recover, making me fresh for next week's training. I would make sure I was progressing in my training by either adding more repetitions or incorporating harder progressions such as archer pull-ups, working toward one-arm pull-ups, false grip pull-ups and muscle-ups which gave me all the variety I needed to stay consistent and make training enjoyable.
The current literature shows that rep ranges between 4 and 35 are optimal for muscle growth, provided you are training within close proximity to failure. So, unless you can crank out more than 35 pull-ups with good form, then pull-ups and their numerous variations and progressions will be an effective growth stimulus over the long term. It's interesting that the most effective exercises are often the basic fundamentals that we start our fitness journey doing, only to end up neglecting as we seek out more novel and exciting ways to train. This experiment has been a good reminder as to why the fundamentals are fundamentals. They're exercises that have truly stood the test of time. They are extremely functional and accessible, and the difficulty level and progressions ensure that you'll be progressing for years to come. Make it fun and engaging by aiming to unlock harder progressions. Less truly is more. And just like with science, focusing on just manipulating one variable at a time is generally going to be the most effective approach to training. Thank you to those of you who made it to the end of this video, and as always, leave any questions, comments, or abuse down below. Cheers.